We love you. Thank you for this morning. You are king over all, and, uh, and we bow the knee to you. Uh, this morning, Jesus, open up your word. I love that uh, on the road to Emmaus, you opened the eyes of the disciples, and you explained how all the Old Testament scriptures pointed to you, Jesus. And that's when they said, oh, didn't our hearts burn within us? Uh, Jesus, we long for that this morning. Would you burn within us, Holy Spirit, as we see you throughout Jose as we start that book. And uh, yeah, we long to connect with you this morning, Jesus. You're good. Uh, so come, Lord, in your name, amen. You guys can be seated. Hey. All right, thanks, you guys. Welcome, church. Uh, man, I, it's, like a, it's like an interestingly bittersweet moment because I love having all the Christmas stuff up and it feels so warm in here and then the internet isn't working and our roof is leaking <laughs> and so uh, so win-win so uh, win 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 <laughs> Brent came in this morning and we're like ooh shoot uh, Brent's got like he's between a waterfall and a pool of water so um, with electronics hmm. no no less <laughs> So good morning, guys. Thanks for jumping in with us. Um, thanks for signing up on uh, the registration. If you're here this morning, you didn't happen to do that. We're not going to come check in tickets. Uh, that's totally fine. Um, we recognize if this is your first time here, we do registrations through our Exit Church app. And so many of you are going to be going home for uh, the, the semester right after this week. And so um, that, that problem for the numbers probably won't exist for the next few weeks. But nonetheless, um, Lord willing, I think what is actually happening, I don't know if we're on the live stream right now or not, but I think our modem is bad. So we need Spectrum to come and fix that. And so, Lord willing, uh, every Sunday at 9 a.m., even while you're at home, you guys can still tune in and watch. If you do plan to come, we ask you, again, like you know, to wear masks and things like that. Otherwise, um, we've got a few announcements. Um, Go ahead and open your phones if you have them. There are a few things that are interactive as well in this. Uh, and while you're doing that, we do have our offering box in the back, and then you can tie through the app as well. We ask you to, uh, to so jump in and partner with us in ministry. Um, it's helpful whenever we have a leaky roof to uh, say, like, <laughs> hey, uh, we have some needs. No. But, we um, leave it leaking so that people feel, feel pressure. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's not what it is. <laughs> oh, that's great. Not under compulsion. Is that what <laughs> yeah, Paul says? Yeah, you got loads of cheerful giver not to give it a compulsion. So that's, that was wrong. That was wrong. <laughs> I said. Okay. Um, uh, so next week, uh, Aiden, if you can throw on the slide, next week we are moving to one service at 9 a.m. only. I recognize during second service I'd put 11 a.m., and I didn't catch it during this 9 a.m. So uh, if you are going to be here in one week, 9 a.m. service, or it'll be online at 9 a.m., again, Lord willing. The second thing is that uh, we have a church directory available. 
I emailed that out this week. I know COVID's going on. You guys are in finals if you're a student. So there's a lot going on. Check your inbox if you're on our mailing list, email list. Um, if you don't have it, come see me. Um, my first question will be like, are you on the email or are you, are you on the directory? Because, you know, I want to know that you're not going to sell our, our info. But anyways, uh, come see me is the point if you want access to the directory so you can know how to connect with people. Um, the next thing, what do I have on there? Oh, yeah, a bunch of you guys are going home, so we need tech help. So if you're here year-round and you feel comfortable um, like being in person, uh, would you consider helping us tech-wise? You don't need experience, um, but we, we'd greatly appreciate it if, if you'd consider that. Uh, we're happy to train you. Uh, we're just plowing right through. The next thing is as you shop. So this is Black, like Thanksgiving, Black Friday. Happy Thanksgiving, by the way. When you do shopping, if you shop on Amazon, if you type in smile.amazon.com and you select Exit 59 Church as the recipient, we get a cut of whatever you purchase. So if you want to help donate for a new roof uh, or whatever is the problem, um, you can do that actually without paying anything. Um, Amazon takes a cut from their side. So that's kind of a cool thing. They do take, I want to say, 18% from whoever is selling the things, so they're doing okay. They can afford to give us a half percent or whatever it is. Yeah, Jeff Bezos isn't hurting. Um, uh, that's all I have as far as the details here. Uh, there are two things that we want to do this morning that are a little abnormal. First is we want to offer to commission. I know Josh, if you want to uh, step up here, um, Josh is graduating this is last week of undergrad. Oh, and so is there anybody else that's bold enough that's like, hey, this is my last Sunday or my last semester. Um, we're going to do this again in April or May, Lord willing, if we're in this space. Um, we also know a lot of folks are online, so we kind of imagine Josh is like standing in for a lot of folks that, that are up here with him. Yeah, for sure. Um, Hopefully they're online, I guess. Do I'm curious if you have anything in mind. We didn't go over this, but... I mean... I, Josh, in particular, has really served a lot with us, so we, I just feel really grateful. So we really appreciate you, Josh, and I'm sad to see you move on, but I'm excited to see what happens next. Um, but I don't really have like any like, I, big plans. I met Josh three or four years ago in chapel at Taylor. I was just attending to see what was going on at Taylor, and uh, all of his roommates were like, prop, prop. I was like, oh, what is going on? He's like, yeah, it's this story about a property. And so he's prop Josh, also known as prop. And, uh, and he's been serving here as a rotation leader for music for a, a minute. And it's fun to see whenever people come in that early on in their college career to see the trajectory and the changes over time. And so if you've known Josh for a little while, uh, it's fun to see where he is now and to, to see that trajectory. I'm excited. It's, it's, it's honestly kind of fun to be in our position to see where students go and where they're at in several years, uh, the trajectory that God has them on. And so um, what, I, what we want to do is pray for you and commission you out. Um, something that I felt like the Lord was putting on my heart as I was reading um, through Exodus is um, when God called Moses, uh, Moses kept deferring and, you know, downplaying his own abilities. And there was a point where, I mean, God's encouragement over and over again was, I'm with you. Like, he, so whatever God calls us to, like he's, he, he, equi- he is with us and equips us for the work of ministry. And then there's a point, you know, where Moses says, not me, Lord. And God's like, okay, now my wrath is going to step. And he's like, okay, I'll do it. So don't get to that point. But um, <laughs> whatever God's calling you to, um, I mean, like he's going to be with you and he's going to go with you and, and equip you and, and walk with you along the way. And so we'd love to pray for that as you go out. Do, do you have a job lined up yet? I don't. I'm okay. kind of in the process. Okay. So. And Josh is looking at doing is looking into full time vocational ministry. So mm. that's great. Cool. Let's pray, man. Yeah. Lord God, thank you so much for Josh and your call on his life and your giftings that you've given him. Um, more than what he can do, I pray or I, I thank you for for who you've created him to be. Um, an adopted child of you, um, a son of full inheritance rights um, in your kingdom and Lord, I, I, I'm, I, as like the parent side of me is sad that like, oh, we're, there's, there's going to be a gap left at exit. And at the same time, I'm super pumped to see where you call Josh to. I think of like a risk board 
and how you are, are playing the game, Lord. Like you're in control. You see all the world right in front of you and you control wherever Josh goes. And so we commit him to you. We ask you, Holy Spirit, to, um, to both be comfort and um, conviction that you would continue to walk with Josh and equip him for the work that you've called him to do. Um, we love this man and uh, we commit him to you, Jesus. It's in your name. Amen. Thanks, man. Appreciate you. Thanks, Josh. And then uh, one thing that I'm really pumped for, the very last thing I have, unless you have anything else, is the, the Rua folks. The Rua folks. And interestingly, Josh actually helped us in the early season with uh, getting this church plant going. And so, yeah, we'll invite the folks that are from Rua uh, up here. If you're not familiar uh, with Rua, we, we helped plant a church in Indianapolis, the north side of Indy. So Josh or anybody that's graduating now or in the future these folks are, are doing a church plan. A lot of them are from Iwu and Taylor, and uh, they're going to tell you a little bit about what they're doing. Do I need to wear this mask up here? Yeah, use it, yeah. All right, welcome. Uh, so, yeah, we came up from, uh, from Rua Church this morning just to kind of give you a little bit of information about uh, what we're doing. Uh, so, again, we're based in Indianapolis, and uh, this started originally two years ago, almost to the week, I think. I mean, this is almost exactly two years ago. Um, yeah, yeah for, right. for, Forrest and Tyler recognize, as I'm sure most of you have recognized, that there is a large uh, collegiate body here at Exit Church, um, which means that there is a lot of turnover and a lot of, um, I guess, displacement, you could say, uh, as people graduate. Uh, and if you're anything like me, uh, like I'm not originally from Indiana, much less Indianapolis. Um, so like I had a really hard time uh, finding a church to call home, and I think uh, you guys both recognize that. Um, so that's kind of how this started as a, a place for, uh, for college students to call home uh, after they graduated as they're moving to uh, a new city. Uh, so if you find yourself in Indianapolis after you graduate, uh, I encourage you to, uh, to come check us out. We're kind of on the north side, uh, I guess between Carmel and Indianapolis. It's right on 465 in Keystone. Uh, you can go to our website, ruachurch.com. That's R-U-A-H, ruachurch.com. And uh, yeah, we have uh, Sunday night services starting at six. So, do you guys have any anything? Yeah. Uh, so, Rua is the Hebrew word for spirit, the spirit of God in the Old Testament. Um, we have a great community, great fellowship. Like you said, we meet Sunday night, six p.m. Um, we're looking specifically talking to uh, graduating seniors this semester. So, I guess Josh, anyone else in the live stream who joined, um, if you find yourself in Indianapolis, we'd love for you to check us out, or maybe next spring. Um, also, I would also challenge anyone who's graduating and doesn't know where they're going to go. If they don't have a job lined up, they don't have a place to um, call home yet, what would it look like for you to join us in Indianapolis and then find a living uh, spot, then find a job alongside that? Um, we'll be here after service. If you have any questions, if you want to engage, Tyler and Forrest have our numbers. If you ever want to uh, contact us or reach out to us. Um, but, yeah, we're, we're honored to be here, and I'm excited about it. Also, I'm going to say a few more things about you guys if you don't mind. Uh, so, so I will say, if you've never moved uh, outside of your own context, uh, except for when you went to college, mo moving to go to college is really different than moving to go to a city to get a job. Because when you go to college, you have built-in community, especially if you live in the dorms. And so um, I, I say that as a segue to what they're also doing. Uh, I think they have, you guys have a men's, group, men's prayer time and a women's prayer time, right, that you guys have, and you are doing, like, on average, maybe once a week, like, getting together for either games or... Sometimes twice. Sometimes twice a week, yeah. Yeah, so, like, so, it's not just a service, it's, it really is, like, a church, it's a community of folks that are regularly engaging, they're in each other's lives, they're in each other's business, which, and it's in a beautiful kind of way, and uh, they, they're genuinely in pursuit of the Lord, it is community with a purpose, and so... Uh, that's really, really valuable. Uh, so especially if you're here and you're about to leave, for, leave for college, uh, I would encourage if you see any folks that are maybe like year-round folks or a little bit older than you, maybe pull them over and ask them if they've ever had that experience and chat with them a little bit. Uh, or ask these guys who, who've had the experience of doing that. So if you don't go to Indianapolis, that I would really encourage you to find a, to find a church fast so that you can be intentional about the kind of community you plug into in the space that you land. Because if you don't, You'll, you might accidentally build community or find community, and it will shape you in, uh, in ways that maybe aren't ideal. So anyways, that's my encouragement to you. This is a great group of folks. Thanks, you guys.
<laughs> Matt, that's Maddie. She's shy. <laughs> Um, maybe I'll pray and we'll jump into the word. Father, thank you again so much for your word and what you're doing. I love seeing uh, Josh getting sent and the Rua folks uh, as a testimony to your faithfulness. Jesus, you're going to build your church. We did everything wrong in planting Rua, and yet they are um, digging into each other's lives and opening up the text and thriving. And um, it's it's a really a testimony to you, Lord Jesus. You are so good. Would you show up this morning and teach us um, kind of, uh, I think of the scripture, rend the heavens and come down. Lord, honestly, the human heart is is the hardest thing I think there is. Would you rend our hearts and, and, um, and open us up, do surgery on us this morning, and let us love you and enjoy you. Um, Holy Spirit, please come and rest on forest. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks. Um. So if we, can get, if we can get the slides up here, I'm going to tell you guys something about Tyler really quick. So Tyler does all of our artwork, and I should, I'd say this often, and I, it really is true. The more you get to know, uh, Tyler just basically does everything, so <laughs> including all the artwork. And so I love what he's come up with for the Jose, that, for the series that we're now stepping into, series, the book. Uh, that's how we do series at Exit. Um, so we just finished the book of Romans. So if you've been here for the last year plus, uh, you made it. And now we're going to move into a new book, the Old Testament. It's not a new book. It's new to us, I suppose. Uh, it's Hosea. Two things I'll say about Hosea on the front end. Uh, Hosea is considered a minor prophet. And what that means, uh, it means a few things. It means you can find it uh, towards the latter end of the Old Testament scripture. And it also means that it is shorter than, the, like, than other prophets like Jeremiah and Isaiah, Ezekiel. When, it, when you hear minor prophets, that's all it means. It just means a shorter book. It doesn't mean like they're lesser importance or, or significant. Um, other thing I want you to know about Hosea, before we actually read the words, is there are um, colorful themes. So you're going to hear the word whoredom like a lot over the next uh, couple months as we dig through this book. In this case, there is three usages of that word in one sentence. Not kidding. <laughs> Oh, you'll see. So, and, you know, and obviously we're also digging into the Old Testament. And so there are some ugly situations that happen in the Old Testament. And in order to understand the context into which Hosea is speaking, we really need to go back and talk about those things. So it's going to be a pretty colorful time together. Uh, God's word is not PG, frankly. So just have a heads up. I want you to know that. Especially if you've got a young kid in the room. Um, we're going to be in the first um, 11 verses of the book. Now, I say it like that. It is mattering on the version you have in front of you. It's the first chapter. But some versions will actually break the chapter at the end of verse 9 and pick it up uh, in verse what, what some books would call verse 10. The, the, the chapter breaks, the verse divisions, those aren't inspired, so they're not doing any violence to the text. But it's the first 11 verses of Hosea. Lastly, um, what we always say and when we're getting into the text, we're going to ask our three questions. What does God's word say? Authorial intent to intended audience. Now I want to pause for a second because we're transitioning from an epistle, a letter to the church written by an apostle in the New Testament, to a minor prophet. And what that means is that we're moving genre, genre of writing. And so when you're reading a genre of writing that is, then it's shifting, it's important for you to know that because the way that the author writes their intent will shift. That's the, that's the meaning of the, writing a different genre. So for example, if you're reading uh, two different p pieces of material, and one is satire, and the other is investigative journalism, the way that you're going to read the intent of the author will be different based on the different like, classes, right? So now we're going to step into um, a minor prophet, and it's going to feel different. So I want you to know that on the front end, which means the way that we approach it will be a little bit different. Okay. Uh, then we get a, we're going to want to go from what does it say on the ground to what does it mean, and finally, how does it land for us? So that's our, that's our task this morning. There is a lot more to say by way of context, but we're actually going to do it in the process of unpacking the text itself, because the very first verse is going to give us context. So, here we go. This is Hosea. The word of the Lord that came to Hosea, the son of Barry, in the days of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah, and in the days of Jeroboam, the son of Joash, the king of Israel, when the Lord first spoke th uh, through Hosea, the Lord said to Hosea, 
Go take to yourself a wife of whoredom and have children of whoredom, for the land commits great whoredom by forsaking the Lord. So he went and took Gomer, the daughter of Diblaim, and she conceived and bore him a son. And the Lord said to him, Call his name Jezreel, for in just a little while I will punish the house of Jehu for the blood of Jezreel, and I'll put an end to the kingdom of the house of Israel. And on that day, I will break the bow of Israel in the valley of Jezreel. She conceived again and bore a daughter. And the Lord said to him, Call her name No Mercy, for I will no more have mercy on the house of Israel to forgive them at all. But I will have mercy on the house of Judah, and I will save them by the Lord their God. I will not save them by bow or by sword or by war or by horses or horse, by horsemen. When she had weaned No Mercy, she conceived and bore a son. And the Lord said, Call his name not my people, for you are not my people, and I am not your God. Yet the number of the children of Israel shall be like the sand of the sea, which cannot be measured or numbered. And in the place where it was said to them, You are not my people, it shall be said to them, Children of the living God. And the children of Judah and the children of Israel shall be gathered together, and they shall appoint for themselves one head, and they shall go up from the land, for great shall be the day of Jezreel. So that's our text today. Now, uh, I'd like to give a little bit of a preview. Uh, The very first verse gives us a list of kings, and some are kings of Judah, and then Jeroboam is the king of Israel. So that tells us the time in history when the prophet Hosea is writing. And so if we don't know the time in history, uh, we're going to probably misunderstand what's happening in the text. And so we're going to spend a decent amount of time Maybe half of our time this morning will be dedicated to understanding the context or the occasion for the prophecy of Hosea, the prophet Hosea. And then we'll look at the actual commands the Lord gives to Hosea, his command to marry Gomer, his command to name his three children the way that he does, and then what that means about the relationship between God and Israel, and what, you know, what God's communicating in that text, and his coming judgment, really. And then finally, we'll look at verses 10 and 11, the way that this chapter ends, at uh, the hope that is offered there at the end. And uh, there's an interesting moment when he says, you're not my people, yet I'm gonna make you a great big nation. And so we need to actually answer what is going on here in the text. And I think we're gonna find something really beautiful. I think that because I prepared the sermon and so I know what I'm gonna say. Uh, So here we go. Uh, Here's the first verse. The word of the Lord came to Hosea, the son of Barry, in the days of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah, and in the days of Jeroboam, the son of Joash, the king of Israel. So this is this time in history. Now, uh, this is complicated uh, because Israel's history is complicated. And I mean that in two ways. Uh, The first way is uh, it's like the ambiguous Facebook relationship status. It's complicated. Like that's how Israel's history is between between Israel and the Lord, right? And and that's probably like a summary of our chapter this week. Uh, and ugly, maybe, complicated and ugly. But it's also complicated because uh, it's just, it, it's, it's literally complicated. The history is complicated because the history of the nation goes in such a way, if you remember, uh, first, the first king they ever have is this guy named Saul, and he's tall and beautiful and capable, and then he just blows it. And so the Lord takes the kingdom away from him, he loses his mind, and it goes to David. David is like, everyone knows King David, right? So he goes from King David to his son, King Solomon, and people often know King Solomon as well because King Solomon is is renowned for his wisdom, and some suggest that Solomon ushers Israel into their golden age as a nation, and what that really means is that they were really economically successful and like socially, diplomatically successful because he was really wise, but the problem is if you measure on God's standards, he didn't do a great job actually. If you go back to the warnings that God gives the people of Israel before they get a king, he says, if you get a king, it won't go well for you because this is what that king will do. And basically Solomon checks all the boxes if you go back and look at it. All the th- and oftentimes, by the way, the things that we celebrate about Solomon, the Lord does not celebrate. So uh, that's not the point of our text today. After Solomon, uh, towards the end of his life, uh, he ends up marrying a bunch of foreign women. And I mean a bunch. So uh, if, you might, if you think of somebody having a bunch of marriages, you might think like three, right? Uh, 300 wives. And that doesn't inc- include his concubines, more than double in concubines. So I have a friend who got a master's in, in, 
and his focus was on social capital, and he had me read and edit his, his master's thesis on social capital. And according to his research, uh, 120 friends is about a cap for a person. And so if he's right, that means that King Solomon has wives that he barely knows. So a lot, okay? And when he does that, he ends up marrying a bunch of foreign women in the mix, and they bring with them their foreign wives, and he builds temple for these temples for these foreign gods, and God is upset with that, right? It's like running around on him. Uh, and so he tells, he tells them that, uh, so then, well then, actually, let, let's move on. So then we get to these three kings, and the first is Jeroboam. Uh, after King Solomon, because of what's going on, a Jeroboam is working for Solomon at the time, He's like a capable construction worker. So he puts Jeroboam in charge of a bunch of stuff. And uh, he, he, the, a prophet gets sent to Jeroboam and he gets told you're gonna be the first king of a divided nation. And the, the, the nation after Solomon dies goes to his son Rehoboam. I told you it's complicated, but it's gonna matter for, for our content today. His son Rehoboam is leading. He leads in a terrible way. He's a taskmaster in the worst kind of way. Jeroboam steps in and he's almost like a union leader. And the people just rally to him, and he, ten tribes go to him. So the kingdom divides. And then there's a northern, the ten, uh, the ten tribes of Israel are the northern people. And then there's a southern kingdom, the two tribes of Judah. So here's also why, there's a bunch of reasons why this is complicated. But there are the people of Israel, and then the northern tribe of the ten tribes, the northern kingdom, is also called Israel. And so, mattering on when you're reading, if you hear the word Israel, it might mean the people of God or those northern ten tribes. So that's confusing, right? Uh, Hosea is preaching, is a prophet in the northern kingdom well after the division of the nations. And we're gonna, gonna go, we're gonna go through a little bit of this complicated history so you get an idea of how patient God has been. But he's speaking to the northern 10 tribes about 740 BC. The kingdom divides around 930 BC, so it's been almost 200 years, okay? So uh, that's what you really need to know in terms of, in terms of context. Now, uh, because he's in the northern tribe, I want to just trace these three kings that I've laid out on this slide, Jeroboam, Jehu, and Jeroboam. So this is another reason why it's complicated is because uh, like we have like Mike and Steve today, they have, uh, you know, Ahaziah and Jeroboam, which are like the common names. And so uh, the way that you can distinguish them is Jeroboam, son of Nabat, versus Jeroboam, son of Joash. So if you think about your last name, it's probably a signifier of like who your father was, in a sense. And so it's not too terribly different in their context, which is why you hear that a lot. All right, so the first king over the northern tribes of Jeroboam. This guy's important because he sins in the kind of way that the nation, after, that the whole 10 tribes of, um, of the northern kingdom follow after for a long time. So I want you to know a little bit about his story. As I told you, he's a talented worker, uh, and for that reason, when the Lord is gonna divide the kingdom because of Solomon's infidelity in a number of ways, he sends Ahijah to, to him and says, hey, you're gonna get 10 tribes. It's gonna be a divided kingdom. Well, Solomon finds out that Jeroboam gets told that by the prophet, so he tries to have him killed. And since Jeroboam doesn't wanna die, he goes to Egypt and he waits until Solomon dies. Solomon dies, his son Rehoboam goes, gets into power, so Jeroboam comes back to the land of Israel, and he's almost like a union leader for the people of God, and he, he engages with, with Rehoboam, and Rehoboam says, he wants to establish his authority as, as a community leader, and so he says, if my father was tough, I'm going to be 10 times as tough as he was, and people think, well, that's not really good for us, and so why would we want to follow you, and so they rally together under Jeroboam, and he becomes the first king of, the, of a divided nation now. Now, here's what I want you to know. This is important. In 1 Kings uh, 12, 27, there's this really, really important text. And I'm actually gonna go there so that, uh, and actually, I should have read something before I get there. I'm gonna read 11:38. This is when the prophet Ahijah is talking to Jeroboam and he says, when you become king, he says this. And if you will listen to all that I command you and will walk in my ways and do what is right in my eyes by keeping my statutes and my commandments as David, my servant, did, I will be with you and will build you a sure house as I built for David, uh, and I will give Israel to you. So when he's giving him the prophecy that he is gonna be the king of a northern people, he's saying, be faithful to the Lord, follow the law. Well, he gets the kingdom a little while later in his life, and in 1227, we're gonna read 
how, what his, basically the first thing he does on the throne. It says this, Paul, um, Jeroboam's talking to himself. If this people go up to offer sacrifices in the temple of the Lord at Jerusalem, then the heart of this people will turn again to their Lord, to Rehoboam, king of Judah, and they will kill me and return to, to, um, to, to Rehoboam. So here, here's what he's saying. He's like, I've got a problem. There is only one temple. It's not in my land. And if they go and work, and if they do like a trek into that land and they go to that temple and they see their, their brothers and sisters and they're worshiping alongside them the same God, it's going to unify them. Worshiping the same God in the same way will reunify the people. And if the people are reunified, they're gonna reunify under Rehoboam, not me, which means I'm gonna die. And so that's his, this is his motive. He's like, I said, I wanna keep the people divided. And so I need to give them an alternative form of worship. This is what he's thinking, right? Well, from there, he does a few things. He says, he gets some counsel, and he recasts these golden calves. Now, if you remember in Israel's history, when they, when they get pulled out of Egypt, they're at the, mount, the base of Mount Sinai, and Moses goes up the mountain to get the law, and while they're waiting for him, they take all their jewelry, they melt it into these calves, and they start worshiping the calves as though that was the God that rescued them from Egypt. And if you remember, God's very upset. And he's actually gonna just totally destroy all of them. And Moses has to intercede on their behalf to not just have them get destroyed. So he recasts these calves. And he says, this is the God that rescued you from Egypt. And there's two of them. And he sets up two different temples. They so don't have to travel quite as far from your house. And he puts one calf in each temple. And then he sets up temple priests. Now they're not Levites in the text is specific, which means he's gonna set up leadership in the church that is in conflict with the design that God gave. And then he says, well, what else? What else is in, the, is, in the, is in the faith that God gave us? Oh, there are all these fee, feasts. And so then he sets up his own feasts, his own you know, rituals and celebrations and holidays. And then at the very end of the text, it says that he just makes this up out of his head. So instead of following God's rules and God's law for the worship of him, he, takes, he, he just makes it up out of his head and he does his own religion. But he still says the God that rescued you from the land of Egypt. So it's still... He's claiming it's the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob that rescued you from Egypt. But then it's a perversion of that religion. And it says that in this way, he caused Israel to sin. And from now on in the, in the text, you're going to hear whether a king is good or not. And one of the things that's going to be asked is, did they draw the people out of the kind of sin that, the, that Jeroboam, son of Nabat, caused the people to sin? So that's a very important notion. I want you to understand like, what it is that Jeroboam, son of Nabat, did that was evil as his first, really his first act as king. As a, as a side note, as a, if you remember back in the book of Romans, he said uh, to be careful of false teachers who cause divisions, who, uh, whose God is their belly, meaning they do things because they, they want they, for themselves and their, their teachings end up causing, causing divisions. Anyways, this is a really, really good picture of that. So here we go, we gotta keep going. Oh no. Is the, let's see. Okay, great. Okay, so the next king in line is Jehu. He's actually not the next king. He's multiple generations down. Um, Jehu comes on the scene uh, while Ahab is king. Ahab, if you, if you know much about Ahab, sorry, there we go. Ahab is a very, he's a weak king, and he's married to the most classically evil queen in probably history, history Jezebel. So Ahab marries Jezebel, and he's a really evil dude, and he's, and he's also weak. Uh, so here's what I mean. There's a time when Ahab goes to Jezreel, which is a location, which comes up in our text today, and there's a guy that lives there named Nabath, and Nabath owns a field in Jezreel that he wants. So he says, hey, let me buy your field from you. And Nabath says, you know, it's been in my family for a long time. I think I'm going to keep it. And so then he goes to his wife, uh, the king does, Ahab. Jezebel. He says, oh man, he won't let me have the field. And he's like, he's really pouting. Imagine a spoiled child who's never been told no, just got told no for the first time. And his wife says, stop crying. You're the king. Kill him and take his land. So he does in Jezreel, right? And that's going to come up later. Well, that's the time that's when this weak guy Ahab is ruling and his evil wife Jezebel, same guy, same woman, by the way, that wants to kill Elijah, the prophet, after he has that big victory in Mount Carmel. Um, well, the Lord uh, is going to take the, the throne away from the, ha the home of Ahab, the family of Ahab. And so Ahab then dies, and Jehu is a commander, and Elisha comes to um, this guy, Jehu, 
and tells him in a very, very similar fashion that we heard about Jeroboam, that he's going to be king of the people. And here's how it works. Jehu was with his other commander buddies. Elisha comes in and says, hey, I need to talk to you. So they go in the other room. He says, you're going to be king. I'm paraphrasing here. He goes back in the room. There's other commander buddies. They say, what did that guy want? He said, oh, you know, he's just some old man. They say, no, he's not. He's the prophet. What did he say? He said, all right. He said, I'm going to be king. They said, that's right, you are, today. And they go and they make it happen, right? And I'm paraphrasing, all right? It doesn't go quite like that. Uh, layman's terms. Um, so they ride to Jezreel where Jezebel is living with her son Joram, who's now the king. And they're in Jezreel because that's where they live now because ever since they killed Naboth and took his land, right? So Jehu rides in, he kills Joram, he, go, he, he gets into the town, uh, Jezebel's in the top of the tower and he says, hey, if you're with me, just go and throw her down. So they do that and she dies, obviously. And it's really colorful, actually. I'm not gonna tell you all the gruesome details. It's gross. It's really, really gross what happens there. Uh, and then he sends letters to all the towns where Ahab's sons live. And he says, hey, uh, if you want Ahab's son to be the king, go ahead and put him on the throne, and he can lead you in the war that I'm going to fight against you, uh, because I'm king now, essentially. Again, I'm paraphrasing. And they all, the leaders of these towns, all write back and say, we're not going to make anyone else king. You're, you know, you do whatever you think is good. He says, if you're really faithful to me, if you really want to be loyal to me, then why don't you come see me and bring the head of that son that's in your town? And so they do that, and he makes a big pile of heads of Ahab's children, and that's how he removes Ahab from the throne. Uh, so Jezreel it has a history of being a very bloody place, right? A, a very like bloody turning of the tables, a, a bloody revolution, a bloody, bloody seizing of power is in the history of Jezreel that comes up later. And then it says this about, about Jehu. It says, but Jehu did not turn aside from the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nabat, which he made Israel to sin. That is, the golden calves that were in Bethel and in Dan. And the Lord said to Jehu, because you have done well in carrying out what is right in my eyes and have done to the house of Ahab according to all that was in my heart, your sons of the fourth generation shall sit on the throne of Israel. But Jehu was not careful to walk in the law of the Lord, the God of Israel, with all his heart. He did, he, he did not turn away from the sins of Jeroboam, the, which he made Israel to sin. So here's the point. At the inception, the very beginning of the northern tribes, you know, as a people, they, they, they go and worship other gods at the very beginning. And then finally we have this revolution where you think, okay, finally we have a guy who's not so weak, who's going to lead the people in a strong kind of way and for the Lord. And, his, and it says this first thing. He goes right back to the exact same sins that the first king did. And so now we're halfway into, their, into their, like the line of this, this northern kingdom, and they have never been faithful to the Lord. Well, it says that he's going to have four generations of sons on the throne, and his fourth son on the throne is Jeroboam, son of Joash. And there's a few things you should know about this king, but I think this is just going to capture it. It says, in the 15th year of Amaziah, son of Joash, the king of Judah, Jeroboam, the son of Joash, king of Israel, began to reign in Samaria. And he reigned 41 years, and he did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. He did not depart from all the sins of Jeroboam, son of Nabat. Never, never changes. They always have this perverted worship of these golden calves with their own temple sites, with their own leaders and their own holidays. They never submit to God's law. He says he restored, this is, this is also true about Jeroboam. He restored the borders of Israel from Labo Hamath as far as the Sea of Arabah, according to the word of the Lord, the God of Israel, which he spoke by his servant Jonah, the son of Amittai, the prophet, who was from Gath Hefer. For, Israel, for the Lord saw that the affliction of Israel was very bitter, for there was none left be, uh, bond or free, and there was none to help Israel. But the Lord had not said that he would blot out the name of Israel from under the heaven. So he saved them by the, land, by the hand of Jeroboam, son of Joash. So then, this is, this is what you need to know then about our letter Hosea. Is Hosea is writing to a people in the northern tribe under the rulership and during the time of Jeroboam, son of Joash, who is himself evil, for one, because he, he has this evil kind of worship, yet he is a successful in military conquest. And therefore, he is speaking at a time when it's kind of nice to be in the northern tribe of Israel. You're winning your battles. Things are going well for you. But what you also have to know is that this is the fourth son of Jehu. 
which means he's, that his son, this guy's son, is not going to be sitting on the throne. So things are going well, but God's wrath is coming. Do you, do you see that tension? So he has this hard job of speaking to a people who probably aren't going to want to hear a negative message about Jeroboam. And then they're probably not going to want to hear that God's wrath is coming. They're going to think everything is fine, right? So this is the context that we're, that we're speaking into uh, for Hosea. And uh, that's what you probably should know as on our way into the letter. But, we should al- but what you should also know is that God has been very, very patient with this northern tribe, these 10, these ten tribes, this northern people. Almost 200 years of infidelity and unfaithful worship, worshiping other gods, that, and all saying that, crediting it to him, taking things that belong to his credit and giving it to these calves, you know, this, like, this really messed up stuff. So God has been very, very patient, and his patience is about to wear thin, and that's what our text is going to be about, and really a lot of Hosea is about. So here we go, getting into the commands here. It says, when the Lord first spoke through Hosea, the Lord said to Hosea, go take to yourself a wife of whoredom and have children of whoredom, for the land commits great whoredom by forsaking the Lord. So he went and took Gomer, the daughter of Diblam, and she conceived and bore him a son. Now, uh, there's a couple things that I want you to know on the front end about, about interpretation in, in, in the history of the church. Uh, there has been some division of God-fearing people in their interpretations. So I want you to know what those things are because I don't want you to be unaware of them. Then I'll tell you my position. We're going to go kind of fast through this. Uh, the first position is that this is entirely metaphorical, that he does not actually ever go marry anybody. Uh, and the reasoning is because God wouldn't command his prophet to do what is explained in Hosea 1, 2, and specifically 3. And the reasoning is because in Deuteronomy 24, it says very clearly in God's law that if you're married to somebody and then they cheat on you and you give them a certificate or divorce if you're not married anymore, it would be wrong to go back and remarry them, that that is a, that is a morally wrong before the Lord. It says that explicitly. And by the time we get to Hosea 3, he does this. And so and some interpreters of the text will say, this is entirely metaphor. He doesn't actually do it. It's meant to convey how gross it would be, but he's not actually doing it. So that's, that's one position. The other uh, position is obviously that he actually does marry uh, Gomer. And in that, there are, there are two interpretive questions that get asked, and they're both around the first word of whoredom here. And the question is, is it the case that he's saying that all of the people are going and worshiping other gods and are therefore under the, the umbrella category of a people of whoredom? And therefore, to go into the city and marry anybody is to marry someone who is unfaithful in character, but not necessarily meaning go marry a prostitute, okay? Uh, just go marry anybody. And what that would mean is that they have this broken character, and it's out of that broken character that, that they go on acting in the way that they do. The other interpretation is that he actually goes in and he's told, find a prostitute and marry a prostitute, okay? Okay, those are the three positions. I'm, I'm of the conviction that this is an actual marriage and that he's actually being told to go marry a prostitute. And let me explain to you why I think that's the case. Two, there are two reasons. The first is this. The purpose of the, of the medium of the, of the imagery that's taking place here in its own context is that Hosea... He goes and marries a prostitute, right? And then the people see it, and it's an ongoing imagery that, they, that people would say, like, why did you marry a prostitute? And it gives occasion over and over again to explain the prophetic word of the Lord to Hosea to the people. It's an ongoing living imagery before them. And if it's metaphor only, it retains some of its impact for us, but it loses a lot of it in its own context. Does that make sense? The same thing is true for the naming your children these names. These are weird names. To name, name your kid, not my people. It's a weird name, Right? And, it's, and if it's a metaphor, you, you know you get the push once, but if it's a person that's walking around and they're constantly asking, oh, that's a cute kid, what's their kid's name? Not my kid. Is that, oh, that's a weird name. Let me explain to you what that means. And now you've got to rehear over and over again the, the prophecy, right? So that's the purpose of the medium is to have a living, living occasion to continually retell the story. So that's my first thought. And the second thought is this, uh, the whole purpose of the gratuitousness of what's taking place is that it's supposed to offend your conscience. So it says, so imagine this. Imagine if um, my, my lovely wife passed away or if I just wasn't married, and then I went and married a prostitute. Let's just say I did that. And you said, Forrest, what are you doing? You can't be a pastor and marry a prostitute. And I said, well, is it really any different than the Lord being married to us? And you'd be like, oh, ouch, right? Like, that's, that's the point. It's supposed to hurt your, it's supposed to offend your conscience, Right? 
Uh, and the point is like, it, you, no, you're a holy man. You shouldn't, the, the holy and the profane, the sacred and the, the clean and the unclean, you're not supposed to touch. And God says, that's the point. I'm this holy, righteous God. You go run around all the time with all these other gods. And then things go bad for you. And you come to me and you say, come back. That should gross you out. Like that I continually take you back, right? This is the point. And so if it offends us to the point of saying this has got to be a metaphor, I think we're maybe getting it. Do you see, you see the idea? It's supposed to be like, woof, to our conscience. Okay. So he gets told to, to do this marriage. Uh, and, he, and he does. He goes and marries this woman. The next thing I want you to see at the end of this text, he says, she conceived and bore him a son. That's important language. It's very clear that the first kid is his. Okay, that's going to come up here in a minute. And then God says this. And the Lord said to him, call his name Jezreel, which is that location. That's like that location of bloody revolution. Uh, for in just a little while, I will punish the house of Jehu for the blood of Jezreel, and I'll put an end to the kingdom of the house of Israel. And on that day, I will break the bow of Israel in the valley of Jezreel. Now, uh, there's a few things to note here. Uh, I've already mentioned why would you name your kid like that. I mean, the idea is to have an ongoing occasion for retelling the, the, the story. But um, historic significance of, of Jezreel, I've already told you a little bit about those, those two things that took place, right? Nabath and how he got his land taken from him, and Ahab's kids, and Jezebel, and I didn't even tell you about all the, all the prophets of Baal that were killed. Uh, it's hist historically a place of bloody revolution. Now, in the commentary that I'm reading, I want you to see the text again, it, it says, you know, when we write this in English, for, uh, he says this, in a little while I'll punish the house of Jehu for the blood of Jezreel. So we write it in English in such a way that conveys a sort of confidence in interpretation that the Hebrew doesn't actually give us in the original language. And it could be said, I will punish the house of Jehu in the manner of Jezreel, rather than uh, f for what happened. Now, it could be the case that God is upset for, what, for the manner in which uh, Jehu unseats the family of Ahab. Because God says, take the throne from Ahab, and Jehu interprets that as kill all his children. But he, God does not say, go kill all his children, okay? Now, he does say afterwards that he's pleased that Jehu accomplished the task. But you, there's some in-between space there where you could say, well, it could be the case that he's pleased that he accomplished the task, but not exactly pleased with the method. Okay, so you could say, but this text doesn't actually necessarily necessitate that interpretation. I think it, what would be safer to say is that uh, bloody revolution, that, that, that his, the family of Jehu will be taken off the throne in the same manner in which the previous generation that he unseated was taken off their throne. It is Jezreel, you kind of have to imagine if you lived in that space, that Jezreel could have a history such that it becomes almost like a byword. Like, ooh, a bloody revolution is like a, like a, like a Jezreel, right? So uh, I want you to know that. That's the historical significance. The future significance, the coming significance, is that Assyria is about to come and conquer the northern tribes of Israel, the ten tribes. And they will accomplish a decisive victory at Jezreel that will break the bow of Israel. When it says the bow, the bow is imagery of like the strength of war. And it will break their military strength by losing the battle at Jezreel. And that actually does happen. So uh, not only is it about Jehu's line being dethroned, but it's also about the kingdom of Israel being uh, taken out off of a seat of autonomy, uh, of sovereignty of their own land. And it goes on. She conceived again and bore a daughter. And the Lord said to him, call her name Mercy, for I will, have, for I will no more have mercy. Sorry, call her name No Mercy, for I will no more have mercy on the house of Israel to forgive them at all. But I will have mercy on the house of Judah, and I will save them by the Lord their God. I will not save them by bow or by sword, or by war, or by horses, or by horsemen. First thing we should know about this, this text. Remember when I said it was important back when it says, she conceived and bore him a son? In our text, these next few verses, it says, she conceived again and bore a daughter. It doesn't say that she bore him a daughter. Now, it doesn't say that she didn't bear him a daughter, but the point is that there's some ambiguity here. We don't know. And that's what happens when your wife is a wife of whoredom, right? Uh, if you look at, if, we're not going to read this this week, but if you go look at chapter 2, verse 4, uh, it also suggests that her children are not all his children. So that's the first thing you should know. There's a question of faithfulness. The next thing is, uh, 
no mercy or not loved, mattering in your translation. What he's saying here is God has had a long season of this compassionate, patient grace on them, not, not exacting justice, not pouring out his wrath like their false idolatrous worship deserves. He's been very patient, but his patience is now wearing thin. He says the, the time has come where I'm gonna have to move over and, and be just and exact my justice through my wrath on these people. And the name of the kid is, is that imagery, that God's patience is now gone. Uh, now, he does give a different decree for the, for the people of the South. And we didn't go into the history of these other kings, but if you, look, if you look at the different kings of the South and you contrast them with the kings of the North, some, not all, some of the kings of the South are, are less evil. Some of them do things that are right in the eyes of the Lord. Some of them even reestablish uh, and te- tear down the, the worship of idols. So uh, for that reason, there is a longer season of patience on the southern tribe, meaning Assyria does not conquer the southern tribes. They try, but God gives them victories. He actually kills a huge, huge number of the Assyrians overnight one night, and they all go, and they go home, essentially. But then Assyria gets conquered by Babylon, and Babylon conquers the south. And so, anyways. All right, we go on. It says, when she had weaned no mercy, means that she stopped breastfeeding, uh, she conceived and bore a son. And the Lord said, call his name not my people, for you are not my people, and I am not your God. So what we need to realize at this point is there are now three kids, and one of them is his for sure. And the other two, it's like, I don't know. And the third one, he actually gives the name of the kid, not my kid. Uh, and so now you've you got to imagine, imagine, uh, imagine being in his shoes and you have, you have your wife, and you love her, right? She's your wife, because the Lord loves us. You can't, if, you can't say it's a dispassionate marriage because you're being, you'd be saying things about how the Lord feels about us, and that just isn't the case, right? And uh, now, it'd be one thing if she is sleeping with people that look like Hosea. Maybe it wouldn't be super obvious. But imagine she's not, and it's super obvious, right? Imagine she's sleeping with someone that has a different tone of skin, for example, and the kid comes out. It's just like obviously not your kid. Imagine like the heartbreak of that moment. And so there's this imagery of the, un, the infidelity and the brokenness of this relationship and the heartbreak that's there. And it's supposed to show us this, the imagery of the Lord in Israel. Right, that's, that's, the, that's the push of what's happening in this marriage as, as this illustration. And, so, and, it's this, and it's ongoing. So to, to have a kid and then to wean the kid and then to have another kid and then we, we're talking about like maybe six years or so at, on, on, the, on the low end. Of, of this going on. And so for that reason, he says, you're no longer my people and I will no longer have mercy on you and I'm going to wreck your day, essentially. Uh, and then he, goes, then he goes on. And this is interesting. He says, yet the number of the children of Israel shall be like the sand of the sea, which cannot be measured or numbered. And in the place where it was said to them, you are not my people, it shall be said to them, children of the living God. Okay, so this is a big, a big odd moment, right? How is it that he's going to destroy Israel and yet increase their number to the, beyond the sand of the sea? sea? And, and how can you say both those things back to back? And so here's what I think we should know. What he, when he says this illustration, greater than the numbers of the sand of the sea, this kind of notion here, um, it's, it should hearken back to Genesis 22:17, which is the Abrahamic covenant, or one of the passes at this. Abraham has just, he was gonna, give his own son in sacrifice to the Lord, and the Lord stops him, and he says, and he, he reconfirms his covenant to Abraham, and he says these words, I will surely bless you, and I will surely multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven and as the sand that is on the seashore. So here's the juxtaposition you need to hear. There is the Mosaic covenant, and there's the Abrahamic covenant. There's God's promises to the people under Moses at Mount Sinai, and then before that, God's promises to Abraham. The promises at Mount Sinai are conditional. If you will be my people, things will go well for you. But if you blow it, I will destroy you, right? And so in that conditional space, they, they have failed. And not like once, right? Like over 200 years consistently, right? And then some. And so he's saying, You've, you, that's it. That's it. I have to, I'm my, I'm my justice is going, to, is going to come out. However... The people's, the Israel's unfaithfulness in their covenant will not cause God to be unfaithful to his covenant to Abraham. Do you see that? God, the people's unfaithfulness will not mute God's faithfulness. And so therefore, the promises given to Abraham will still come true. And now there's a big question in the air. How? How can that be, right? How can it be the case 
that he destroys these people that are the line through which the, the Abrahamic promise is supposed to go through, and yet the Abrahamic promise still stays intact. How can that be? And that's when I think we get to, the, to Jesus in the New Testament and the gospel, right? Because through the people of Israel who become a remnant in exile, who then come out of exile and have, you know, then again get dominated by other countries, uh, eventually through Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, all the way down through, to, through King David's line, all the way through comes Jesus. And then from Jesus, Emmanuel, God with us, who lives the righteous life that you and I should have lived, uh, he dies the death that we deserve. He credits us with his righteousness. All we put our faith in him, and we become children of the living God, right? Remember that? And if you go back to Romans 5, if you go back to Romans 5, it says these three descriptors of us, that we were weak and ungodly, that we were his enemies. And yet, in that moment, he reconciles us through Jesus. And you fast forward to Romans 8, and because Jesus has saved us, we are not condemned and God's spirit is in us and in the spirit of God in us from, from that that we cry out, Abba, Father. And if you go back even in Romans again to Romans 4, it says we are children of Abraham because Abraham is declared righteous by faith just like us. So all who put their faith in Jesus and are declared righteous are thereby children of Abraham through Jesus who is a child of Abraham. And they're like Abraham in that righteousness. So uh, I, I highlight that because we've been in Romans and because I think it shows really clearly how through the gospel, God is able to remain faithful even to, through to a people who are unfaithful to him uh, in, the spite of, in, in all the presence of his justice. And it goes on, in case we're not totally clear that this is Jesus yet, it goes on and says this, and the children of Judah and the children of Israel shall be gathered together and they shall appoint themselves for themselves one head, and they shall go up from the land, for great shall be the day of Jezreel. So here's the first thing you should know about this coming leader, is that uh, when, they, when he comes, that the children of Judah and the children of Israel, a divided people of God, will become a unified people of God under this, this character, right? Unity in him. The second thing that it says is they shall appoint for themselves one head, he used this headship language. I think that Paul purposely borrows this headship language. And it says they appoint, it for them, appoint, appoint him themselves. Now, you might say, well, we didn't really appoint Jesus as Lord. But we say, but if you are the people of God, you are the people of God because you declare Jesus as Lord. Right? That's what it said in Romans 10. This is how you're saved. That you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead and you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord. And so now you will, willfully submit to him as, as head and as leader. And as, and as such, unified worship creates a unified people. The very thing, by the way, jo Jeroboam, son of Nabat, tried to uh, avoid. Uh, Jesus is correcting. And then finally it says this, and they shall go up from the land, for great shall be the day of Jezreel. Now, that, this is an interesting part. Um, this is how I read this. How can he say great shall be the day of Jezreel after using Jezreel as a byword, as a space of bloody turning of the tide, bloody revolution? How can you call it great, right? And he said, well, there's something in connection with this coming king who will unify the people and, uh, and he'll be the head of that people that has, there's a bloody turning of the tide that is later turns, turns celebration, celebratory. And I gotta think like I'm preaching in front of a cross, Right? And if you, a cross in its own day is certainly a space where revolutionaries would die a bloody end, right? This is what it would typically be for. But Jesus takes that and he dies a bloody death in such a way that turns the tide for us, where we go from being the enemies of God to being brought in as family and co-heirs of the Christ. So much so that what was once an ugly image of bloody revolution becomes something great and something that we celebrate, something we give to our children, we wear around our necks, uh, we certainly would say great is the day of the cross. And so I think there's something really beautiful in there that's pointing forward to the cross of Christ. That's how I see that. So that's, that's, this is our text today. Uh, Jesus, Jesus is the person who this is about, these last two verses. He is the head of the church. You can go back and read that in Ephesians 1.22 and Ephesians 5.23 and Colossians 1.18. Through him, those who are not God's people are his people, including specifically us. And he has turned our fortunes through the cross. And so Jesus is the fulfillment of this word. So what do we learn? What do we learn in our text today? I think we learn a few things. And the first I'd say is this. The Lord is patient. Don't get me wrong. The Lord is patient. However, 
The Lord's patience does not mute his justice. What do I mean? The Lord is patient with us for a long time, but there comes a day when the patience is exhausted and you get justice, which means you don't get forever to put your faith in Jesus. You don't get forever to repent, right? You get this life and that's it. And so uh, that, 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 that should be a sobering thing to consider. God is certainly patient and he's extremely loving and kind but it does not mute his justice. The second thing we should note is this, is that God is both holy and to be revered and worshiped, right? Because that's what they're being critiqued for is not doing that. But he's also very personal. He likens himself to a loving, affectionate, faithful husband. So he wants this kind of intimacy and relationship. Yes, he's a holy God to be revered and feared and respected in a tremendous high kind of way. But he's also very, very personal, very personal. And I think we, it, it behooves us to get both, to get both. Um, if we, because we're a Protestant tradition, by the way, we tend to lean into the personal affectionate kind and we often lose the holiness spot. If you were Catholic, I think you would probably lean in to the holiness side and lose the affectionate uh, personal side. So, uh, or another way of saying this is if you come from what you might call high church, highly liturgical very structured. Sometimes you lean into God's holiness, but lose the affection. If we're low church, this is, we're about to have a baptism in a horse trough, so we're definitely low church, okay? Uh, so, uh, so that we get the personal side, but we tend to miss, miss the holiness. But God is both, and I think a biblical view of him uh, tries to hold those things in tension. The last thing is this, is that Jesus is our redeemer. Jesus is the one. Listen, we're Gomer. In, this, in the case that we're not clear about this, we're Gomer, all right? And if not for Jesus, we would be getting God's justice, right? And yet, because of him, we're able to come home. We're able to go back to a, to a Lord in such a way that others might say, that's gross. And it would be, had it not been the case, that Jesus actually genuinely forgives us of all of our sins and credits us with righteousness. So not only does God welcome us back, he does so in such a way that does not violate any, any moral duty. So, what do we do? What do we do with this? First of all, we say worship God alone. That's where they went wrong, right? And where did they go wrong specifically? This is important. They, they took what was already existing, and they say, you know, I'm gonna make this my own. I'm gonna make it up. And so I'm gonna, I don't really like what, they, what God has to say about sin. So I'm not gonna, we're not gonna talk about sin. And I don't really like the way that God says this is how we're supposed to worship. So I'm gonna worship in my own way. I'm gonna celebrate the things that I think are worth celebrating, and I'm just gonna call it worship of God. That is perversion of the Christian faith. You just make it up out of your own head instead of lending authority to the word of God. That is rebellion. That is not worship of the God of heaven and earth. That's worship of whatever God you made up in your imagination. It's cheating, right? That's important to know. And so worship God alone on his terms, in his word. That's huge. The second is this. We want to emotionally invest in our relationship with the Lord. It's not enough to study the text and check the boxes and get your answers right and not ever lean in emotionally. Can you imagine a marriage like that? Imagine if I did everything right by my wife but never connected with her heart. It would miss the point. And God likens himself as a faithful husband. And so we wanna lean in not just getting things right, although we wanna do that. We also wanna lean in in prayer and connect with the heart of the Lord and uh, and see our sin not just as getting something wrong, but as a violation of real, emotionally attached relationship. And the third thing is to proclaim Christ as king because he is the one in whom we have grace and forgiveness. He is the singular head, the, the singular one to worship that unifies the body under one head, right? And uh, him alone. And that goes with the first point. Now, there is a fourth point that I wanna highlight, and it's gonna feel a little bit uh, isolated in on, on, on a narrow scope of folks. Uh, but I think that I want everyone to listen up about this because even if you're not married, which is who this is really about, married folks, I, I think that marriage touches all of our lives. It'd be easy to say that the marriage of Gomer and Hosea is one that reflects the relationship between God and his people, but mine doesn't do that. But when you get to Ephesians 5, what you find is that, that you can't say that anymore. Because in Ephesians 5, Paul's describing marriage and he says, wives, love your husband like Christ loves the church. Lay your life down for her. So how does Christ love the church, right? This is how we know what love is, that Jesus Christ laid his life down for us. 
so we ought to lay our lives down for one another. That's 1 John 3, 16 and 17. Or what he says in the book of John, greater love has no one than this, that he laid down his life for his friends. So husbands are called to love their wives at their own expense and for the benefit of their wives. Love is at your expense for their benefit. And then he turns and he says, wives, submit to your husbands and respect them as Christ does to the church. This is what's good and fitting. And then he goes on towards the end of this text. He says, but I'm not just talking about marriage. I'm talking about this mystery of Christ and the church. And now what we would say is that every marriage, and at least every in-house marriage, is an ongoing image of Christ and the church. And that looks a lot like Hosea and Gomer. So then this is the question that we need to, that we need to ask ourselves, especially, I'm going, to lean, I'm going to lean into you men first. Men, you who are married, if someone comes into your home and they look at the way you treat your wife, and they, actually, and they were able to see it, maybe even the places where you don't want them to see, and they thought, okay, if I become Christian and I'm a part of the church, that's how Jesus is going to treat me. Do I want to be in? That's a hard question to ask, right? Or similarly, if you go into someone's home and they see the wives, and they say, okay, I can be a Christian and I can treat Jesus like the way this woman treats this husband, and they get to see all the spaces where you get to treat how you treat your husband. Do you think you'd be painting an accurate picture of what, it's, what is appropriate for the church to treat Jesus, how it's appropriate in that space? And if you can't answer affirmatively, then I think there's, you need to go back and you need to start proclaiming the right kind of message about the relationship between Christ and the church. Because uh, I've heard it said like this, your marriage preaches, just like Hosea and Gomer. I'm going to invite the worship team back up uh, and we're going to worship our king I'm really excited. If, if, if that was a lot, I think that what we're going to read in the rest of the letter is going to be further unpacking what we're really getting into in these first few chapters. And so we're gonna, there's a, fan, a good number of chapters here to, to unpack. So we're going to be talking about this kind of topic a lot uh, for the next few weeks, especially when it comes to the history. I know the history is a lot. So you guys really stuck it out. It was a long sermon. I apologize. And I'll pray for us. Uh, Lord Jesus, we just love your word. Uh, even the colorful places, Lord, you teach us so much. And Lord, we, we openly confess that we are the kind of people that, that run around and we don't love that about ourselves. And so Lord, we ask that you would do your work in us, that you would uh, work in us in such a way that, that makes us as faithful as you are. Because Lord, that's our desire. We wanna be a faithful spouse to you as your bride. And it is an honor to be yours. So Lord, we thank you that you purchased us. We thank you that you love us at your expense and for our benefit. And Lord, it's our aim and our desire to worship you and you alone. So we love you so much. We thank you for the cross. May you be glorified in our whole life. Amen. Go and stand with us as we sing. worship our king come let us bow at his feet he has done great things see what our savior has done see how his love overcome he has done great things he has done great things Oh, hero of heaven, you conquer the grave. You free every captive and break every chain. Oh, God, you have done great things. You dance in your freedom, awake and alive. Oh, Jesus, our Savior, your name lifted high. Oh, God, you have done great things. Faithful through every storm, you'll be faithful forevermore. You have done great things. I know, and 
And I know that you'll do it again For your promise is yes and amen You will do great things God, you do great things Oh, hero, here we go! Oh, hero of heaven You conquer the grave You free every captive And break every chain No, God have done great things. You dance in your freedom, awake and alive. Oh, Jesus, our Savior, your name lifted high. Oh, God, you have done great God, help us celebrate your name. The ways you, Jesus, have uh, fulfilled the law, have been faithful through all ages. Let us sing hallelujah with all the angels. Here we go. Hallelujah, God, above it all. Hallelujah, God, unshakable. Hallelujah, you have done great things. God, above it all, hallelujah, God, unshakable, hallelujah, you have done great things, you've done great things, oh hero of heaven, you conquer the grave, you free every captive and break every chain, no oh, God. You have done great things. We dance in your freedom, awake and alive. Oh, Jesus, our Savior, your name lifted high. Oh, God, you have done great things. Oh, hero of heaven, you conquer the grave. You free every captive and break every chain. Oh, God, you have done great things. Dancing your freedom, awake and alive. Oh, Jesus, our Savior, your name lifted high. Oh, God, you have done great. You have, you have done great things. Oh, God, you do great things. Walking around these walls, I saw by now they fall, but you have never failed me yet. Waiting for change to come. Knowing the battle's won For you have never failed me yet Your promise still stands 
great is your faithfulness, your faithfulness. I'm still in your hands. This is my confidence. You never failed me yet. Ooh. I know the night won't last. Your word will come to pass. Sing your praise again. Jesus, you're still enough. Jesus, you're still enough. Oh, keep me within your love. My heart will sing your praise again. I'd like to read from Psalm 89, verses one through two. Um, and it says, I will sing continually about the Lord's faithful deed to future generations. I will proclaim your faithfulness for I say, loyal love is permanently established in the skies. You set up your faithfulness. Um, uh, there's so many co connections to Hosea in this Psalm of this um, this, this covenant, this eternal covenant that God has with his people and his promise still stands. But I ask you to rest in that. Whether you find yourself in a dry season or whether you find yourself in a wandering season, um, I would encourage you with that. God's promise still stands no matter what. Nothing can change that. God's love for you and his, um, his covenant, his promise towards you. Um, I would just ask you to remember that as we sing the rest of the song.
Hosea to bring your marriage to life, your marriage with us. And uh, Lord, I thank you for good pushback, good uh, healthy reminders of man, especially as a, as a husband, Lord Jesus. Mm. May our relationships preach your gospel, um, in particular, how we treat significant others and our spouses. We love you, Jesus. Help us to love you the way that you love us. Amen. You're good, Jesus. I pray that in your name. Amen. Guys, we love you. It's going to be a minute before we see many of you again. And uh, because of that, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm a little sad, but, but I love you guys and, and finish strong. Um, for those of you that... I don't know if I said this earlier, um, we're going to do a baptism. The the student, it's a Taylor student, she requested to get baptized at the 11 a.m. service. We plan to record it, and so uh, we'll post that on our social media later. Otherwise, I hope you guys have a really good break. Uh, keep your rhythms with the Lord as much as possible, even though you're out of rhythm academically. So we love you guys. Have a good break. See ya.
needed it. That was what I requested. I 